What's up, everybody? We are Just Two Dorks, and in today's episode, we're going to be reviewing episode one of The Secret Invasion Show on Disney+. Plus. I am joined by my friend, Scotty. Uh, Scotty, how are you feeling about Invasion so far? Uh, I really like it. Um, I like the atmosphere. It's different, but I, I think it's a cool way to go about things. All right, sweet. I love to hear it. Let's get into it. So the episode starts off with a very spy intense sort of a theme, which threw me off a little bit because I'm more into the, the big explosions, kind of James Cameron, Avatar style stuff. But after talking with you, you kind of brought me back and you made me a little bit more interested just on how you uh, viewed it thematically and you shared that with me. So why don't we have you walk us through the plot? I'll try and just tag in every once in a while. Okay. Uh, so we open on Agent Prescott talking to Agent Ross. Um, Agent Prescott... You know, seems to have, you know, stumbled across this big conspiracy that all these attacks that have been by supposedly different groups have actually been all by the scrolls. Um, obviously, at this point, like, it seems a bit confusing that Agent Ross is even there. And that was the first thing I kind of wondered about is how is he there acting like a CIA agent when he, last time we saw him at the end of Wakanda, um, he was on the run and probably hiding out in Wakanda. So... Timeline wise, I wondered if maybe this had happened before that, but then as things progress, we find that unfortunately, you know, Shuri's favorite colonizer is actually a scroll. Um, he has a very bad fall, and I guess we had talked about this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in the episode. It does seem like he's not a very strong scroll, like, it seems pretty easy for him to get taken down, which is interesting. Uh, but he does die, and that's how we find out he's a scroll. Um, and then we kind of are set up with this, like, big conspiracy about the scrolls. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When we were talking about that conspiracy theorist that he was there, Agent Prescott, uh, it, he was very intense about it, and he made it, he laid out the work that it was a very intricate uh, invasion, title, uh, of, like, the deepest parts of the government, how he could trust nobody, even on the inside of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, and he was trying to get hold of Nick Fury, so... Uh, I do think that that beginning laid the groundwork, and I do have a lot of questions about Agent Ross, too. Like, is he dead? Like you said, like, he, he had, uh, the CIA, the Madam Viper, he had kind of betrayed her. So I assume that if a, a scroll can't put his face on and then be walking around like nothing. Like, even if it was a scroll, they would get arrested, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that was very, very interesting. Uh, and then... Fury comes down, right? We see Fury emerge from the spaceship. He's been up on what they've been calling Saber, and Saber is the biggest red flag for me in the episode. So, in Saber, they say that it is, like, the most advanced uh, defense system known to man, which made me th start thinking about Captain America, Winter Soldier, and how the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. felt that, or the hire, the senator, or whatever it was, felt that he needed to betray Fury because Fury wouldn't be on board with those helicarriers that would like preemptively take out people. So in my mind, Saber, the most advanced defense technology ever, I'm like, why would Fury be in on that? Why would he uh, like sign off and actually spearhead that? But I have a lot of questions about Saber. What are your, what are your initial thoughts about Fury uh, leaving the planet, first of all, right after he comes back from the blip, working on the security defense system? What do you think the defense system is going to be like? Well, I mean, I think this is a different Fury than we knew before the flip, and they obviously touched a lot on this in that, this episode as well. But, I mean, it's not crazy that he would be up on this space station that potentially is, like, a defense for Earth after basically, you know, they were invaded by aliens and had no way to protect themselves other than the Avengers, and even that, you know, couldn't do very much. So I, I think this may have shifted him into a different mindset that hey we do need something bigger to protect us in the future but at the same time like maybe that was also part of his plan for helping the scrolls which we don't know for sure yeah lots of questions and then, and then we're introduced to the villain right after we hit, learn a little bit about saber fury's back everyone's accusing him of dropping a step and then we meet the the big bad gravik why don't you tell us a little gravik because i thought he had a very interesting backstory uh, I mean, we don't find out a lot about him in this episode. Um, obviously, he is a scroll. He has uh, Talos has been kicked off of the council, um, and now Gravik is is on the council, and he's very war hungry and seems to really hate 
the humans. Um, and he is hiding somewhere in Russia because we learned that um, the scrolls are immune to radioactive activity, basically. So they can hide in these sites that no normal human can live in or would be in. Um, and then we find out it's called New Scrollos later. Um, but he is basically the mastermind behind everything, and there's a big attack that's being planned um, with a with a dirty bomb. Yeah, and and I, I guess that's when we're we're soon introduced to uh, the roadie talking with the president, kind of laying the groundwork that Fury and Hill are able. So they're gonna be they're gonna have no team to side on here. Like they're not able to go to their old connections in the government. They're, they don't have any, like, Skrull allies besides Talos, who, like you said, was kicked off the council. So they're kind of, it's them up against the world right now. And with these these plans happening and the Skrulls having uh, infiltrated various positions in the government, they don't know who they can trust. It puts them in a very precarious situation. And then, uh, do, you, do you know what a dirty bomb is? I don't know what the definition of a dirty bomb is or how big of an impact it could be, but they they build it up that it, that it would be huge. Yeah, I think it's just... It, it the massiveness of how it's going to explode, uh, I guess. Like, it's not a controlled thing, but they don't really... They just talk about it being a dirty bomb. Right. Okay, and then, and then that brings us to uh, Fury's introduction, well, reintroduction to Talos, right? When uh, I thought it was very interesting how they had that plant from the original uh, home planet of the Skrulls, and I thought there was a lot of foreshadowing there in two different ways. Uh, the plant grows and is thriving, and Fury makes note of that. Fury, I believe, says, you always thought that could happen. And Talos says, I still think it can. But in my mind, that's Talos almost saying that, like, I think the Skrull should stay on Earth, and they can floor it, and then it can work. And Fury had a, a very apprehensive look on that, and I think that's built on the point where you said Fury felt that his homeworld was vulnerable to outside attacks not from not like infighting between humans but from you know outer space and it, it, i got a weird feeling from fury that he was a little bit against that idea of bringing girl pieces into earth more than have already been yep um we do unfortunately also find out that talus's wife who I, I think she was almost like kind of behind the plant flourishing like she had a big part to play in it and we find out that she's unfortunately passed away. Um, and before that, Gaia, his daughter, left as well. So, like, that's kind of set that stage as well, that his wife is dead, but he has a daughter, uh, but she's not with him anymore. All right, why don't, why don't you tell us about this daughter of his? Uh, well, most would recognize her from Game of Thrones as the mother of dragons, but uh, we meet her basically in New Skrullos. Um, she's welcoming, like, a new scroll. Um, interesting enough, it seems like they have the same plant that Talos was just showing Fury, because she offers it from the glove box, so they have produce there, she talks about them having scroll wine and things like that, um, and this is in a radioactive area in Russia. Then, um, it is just interesting, because once they enter there, she talks about how they're always in scroll skin, but every time you see someone in New Scrollos, they're all in their human skin. So it's just a bit interesting. Like maybe they didn't have the budget for everyone to walk around with scrolls the whole time. Maybe. <laughs> what I will say about this show though, which I thought which I enjoyed very much, is it seems like the the effort put into the animation was a lot better. Like when we saw uh I guess not Agent Ross. We saw not Agent Ross die and his face goes from Agent Ross to Scroll. I thought that looked a lot better. Than some of the animations we saw in She-Hulk and in Moon Knight, so I thought that they are definitely putting more effort in. Which probably Samuel yeah. Jackson, right? Probably like, no, 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 you're not cheaping out on me, guys. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. So New Skrullis, that's a very interesting concept, eh? And like you said, the soldiers, and they kind of they kind of uh, hedge their bets on that because she does say the soldiers stay in skin, so it's easier to trick uh, enemy scrolls and also. The humans it's harder for them to be found out if they're constantly in skin yeah i just expected like when they were in like new scrollos like not at the gate that like they would be in scroll form but i guess not yeah how did you feel about uh it, it, it kind of looked like almost like a ghetto right because it, it's an abandoned uh power plant but then you have kids playing and, and obviously the radiation doesn't affect them so that bad but it just it's like they're living in poverty now obviously they're trying to get out of that poverty which is where Gravik's whole plan comes in. And we start seeing 
the groundwork of that plan. But an alien abduction. Luckily, no probing, uh, except of the mind. How did you feel? I thought it was very interesting the way that they're introducing how the scrolls are kind of getting even deeper into uh, the characters that they're taking over. Well, it just it showed you like kind of the massiveness of their their operation. Like they have lots of people there that are all strapped to these machines, and they're taking their skin and also hooking up to later what we find out are called fracking machines, fracking mm. pods, fracking pods, um, to like basically have a mental link with them at all times, so they have their memories. And it seems like it's not just like a download; like they have to keep them alive. Uh, otherwise, I don't think they would have them just there you know, the whole time, they would just kill them. So it seems like they need, like, a constant connection with their brain to have their memories and thoughts so they can continue to infiltrate and, and pretend to be them better. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. If, if Agent Ross was kidnapped, I guess we might see him later on. In the Which could be a, a cool little reveal. Maybe he'll come in and help. But like you said, I think he's stuck up on, on this still. Yeah, and I, I just have a feeling that, like, they don't have his mental connection and that's why that agent Ross was found out so easily because people knew it wasn't him. Um, but I guess we'll see like, where is agent Ross is the question. Yeah. I hope they answer. I hope they just don't leave it like that. <laughs> uh, so meanwhile, what we've had happen, I think a little bit before the scene we just talked about is Fury goes for a little, a little saunter through the, through Moscow and uh, he gets picked up by Sonya and I forget her name you something uh, of mi6 and this whole show i i kind of or this episode rather i had this like nagging thing in my head where it's like they kept making fury look dumbed down and how he's lost a step and everyone keeps making note of that but there was an interesting part where he literally says to her i wanted you to capture me and in being captured he does plant a bug which kind of helps them progress the plot right it, it helps them know what's happening next. How are you feeling about just Fury as a character in this first episode? I mean, they're trying to represent that, like, he got blipped, he came back, and it's hard to be the same. And they, I mean, they have touched a little bit on that in, like, the, the third Spider-Man as well, because, like, obviously, you know, he was a kid and got blipped, and, like, the people he was going to school with for, you know, for five years were without him, and then he's back, and it's weird, right? Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it makes sense for Fury who is a person who is all-knowing to, like, lose out on five years and he comes back and he doesn't know what has happened. Like, that's hard for someone like him. So I do appreciate them kind of sh highlighting his struggle, just even mentally, coming back and just being a bit broken, which I think is not not out of the norm to expect for, for something like that. Yeah, they're definitely humanized, right? Like, he used to yeah. be the all-knowing, the all all- uh, controlling super spy and they're definitely humanizing him which i think you need to do because he's the protagonist of the show he needs to have faults otherwise you yeah. get the the issue where it's just like oh the main character was never in any problems all right so in in learning that plant they they learn from the mi6 from sonia uh about the dirty bomb and they're able to track down the person who's going to collect the bomb and that person just so happens to be gaia happens to be talos's daughter of course right so we need to have that uh, confrontation. How did you feel about that whole confrontation with Gaia? Uh, obviously, there was a little scuffle with Marie Hill previous. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because that leads into something you mentioned earlier with uh, Prescott and Ross. Uh, I mean, first, the bomb maker happens to be a scroll too. So, right. like, that's a point, which I guess isn't too surprising. Him and Talos fight. Fury shoots him. Uh, but then Maria and Gaia have a fight. Maria kind of gets her ass kicked. Um, but Tal Talos didn't know that Gaia was with Gravik, obviously. So, like, he initially thought she was just any scroll, and then she turns around and he recognizes her. But at the same time, I find that interesting, because he recognizes her in human skin. So that's what she's always looked like, which is interesting to me, because, like, even growing up from a girl, like, that is always, I guess, the way she has looked. But who is the person that she's pretending to be? Like, is that actually a person that's alive? Is she captured? But, like, how does he recognize her, I guess, is just my... That's a question. good point. And that also brings up the question of, like, Skrull's evolution as they age. So, like, when she yeah. was a young girl, she probably, you know, took on the version of a young appearance. 
then as she gets older, she might be changing people, or does she visit that same girl to to just re up, you know, get the new patch? <laughs> it's yeah. kind of been interesting. But yeah, like you said, it's interesting that Talos knew right away, and she knew right away. But I think Talos has had the same. Um, yeah, he's yeah. always looked the same. But yeah. her, I was just a little bit more interested because I would have thought that maybe, especially if she's helping Gravik, that she would maybe pick a different skin that her father would recognize. True. So then she'd be even more incognito. Anyway, I don't know if I'm thinking too much about it, but they do have an interaction once he figures out it's her. Um, but apparently she didn't know her mother died. So that's upsetting for her. Um, and he doesn't get the bomb from her. He doesn't, you know, shoot her or anything like that. Because obviously that's his daughter like he's not going to shoot her so she gets away she has an emotional moment because she just found out her mother died um but he does imply that who she is working for is the reason her mother is dead like that's her her murder so that obviously has a bit of an internal struggle for her um then uh kind of fast forwarding from there maria and and fury then have a big talk um maria's you know very worried about fury she doesn't think that he's who he was and he's going to be able to handle what they have to do um going forward so that was another humanizing moment i guess for them as well yeah i i, I took a little offense to that one it's like <laughs> hey he's your mentor be nice <laughs> but i yeah. mean she got blipped too right like it's yeah, kind of at the true. same time like fury like I know you're struggling, but like she also got blipped, so she gets it too. Um, but anyway, that was it was a little bit hard to watch, but I mean, it was a human humanizing moment again for Fury, just to show kind of the struggle that he's been dealing with. Yeah, fair enough. So, so then what happens after Guy gets away? Which, by the way, I have a huge problem with Talos letting her get away. Yeah, don't shoot her in the head. I get that it's your daughter, but also like. She gives him a little shove, and then he just lets her go with the bomb that he knows is going to be used to kill thousands of people and start an international conflict. That is yeah. the stupidest thing a protagonist has done in media in a very long time. Like, grab the bomb from her. Tell her no. Like, that's your kid. <laughs> like, no, you're gone. Time out. Go to your room. Like, something like that. <laughs> Don't just, like, a little shove. Okay, I guess I'll let her blow up thousands of people. But I, I guess fair. it is it's what it fair. is. I didn't feel the same thing you felt from it, but I get your point. I just didn't really, I don't know, I didn't question it too much. Fair enough. I mean, they had to move the plot forward, which yeah, exactly. is where we start leading to, right? So uh, what happens from that conversation where she finds out about her mother's death, Gaia, I have a big problem with Gaia's character. We'll be talking about that as we go. So she flips and she, she contacts Talos and they get together and she tells them every single part of the plan that she just put into motion anyway so she says that but when she was talking to gravik before that he says to her thanks to you now we have the bait so in that moment you see like it's not about the bombs and destruction like they're using the bombs as bait for fury so you question at the same time is she truly flipping and helping Ta talos or is this just more progressing the we like the bait aspect like they have to let him know so that he goes after it because if he doesn't know where it is then it's not really the bait right yeah i suppose i thought it was interesting that they chose the word bait because uh well as we learn so guy's information was very far off very far off right um, and did she know it was far off or does Gravik already worry about her? And you kind of see that in this episode already. Yeah. They don't really trust her. And it would make sense that he's almost like setting her up to test her in this episode. Like, is your father going to know where the bombs are? And sure enough, they do know the bags are marked. So like, did Gravik know already that they were marked? And that's why when they get there and go after the bags, there's no bombs in it because he knew that she was going to give that information. But did she know yeah. that she was giving false information? Like, there's so much like this is the what I love about it, though, the whole spy aspect. Like, right. what what did she know when she was talking to her father? Was she really flipping at that moment or was she actually like doing what Gravik wanted her to do? Right. So then for me, with those two scenarios, there's only two outcomes and neither of them are good for Guy and Mike. The first one is that now Gravik knows that she's a turncoat and is going to kill her. 
The second one is that she is an evil person and cannot be redeemed. So Talos is going to have to kill her at some point. Because it just... Getting the bomb and then either... Getting the bomb and getting people killed, that's bad, okay? Mm -hmm. Getting the bomb and then leading the people who are trying to stop the bomb from going off to for sure failing, that's like, now you're evil. Now now like you can't be redeemed. And and sure enough, just like in Game of Thrones, she was unredeemable by the end of that. Uh, <laughs> but we get a really cool scene. And we talked about Fury going for a walk earlier. So after the bag scene happens, Fury is greeted by the creepiest little child <laughs> with a beach ball. And, with the ball. Yeah, with the ball. <laughs> and they go on this little walk together. And during this walk, he sees various characters that throughout the episode we've seen glimpses of. Like, when he went for his walk, he saw the same girl. He saw another girl making out on the bench. And there was another scene with a guy at the bar. And the guy at the bar had some very choice words for Fury. He said, you will never be the man you once were. And so what we find out is all of those characters were graphic. Which, a couple questions here. Who is Gravik making out with on the bench? <laughs> well, also, like, it goes from that transition of the, the woman on the bench making out with the guy yeah. um, to the girl so quickly. Like, yeah. how did he get over there? But maybe there's multiple scrolls involved, and he, those maybe. are just, like, anyone can take those shapes, so maybe it wasn't him. I, I do think it probably was him on the bar, but yeah. it's hard to believe that he was the woman and then the child because, like, I don't know how he would have moved that so fast. Quickly. Like Goku instant, trans yeah. instant transmission. Uh, well, you don't get it. It was still cool like to see him like every time he like lost sight of the person, it turned into another like person he had seen. Like I really liked that yeah. cinematography, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Every time it happened, I went, oh, huh? yeah. Ah! <laughs> Especially with the Mako girls. Like, oh my God, who is he making up? Because throughout the episode, they really highlighted that character on the bench, the girl who was making up and yeah. looked at him all slyly. And yeah. it's like, why would they do that? And then there's the payoff at the end of the episode, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but then it's Gravik. And Gravik, there's no words. Like, Fury starts taking his gun out once he knows the scroll. And Gravik doesn't say a single word, he doesn't let Fury get close. There's nothing, which to me, this is an amazing villain development because it shows that he is not about to play games. Immediately pulls out that trigger. Boom. Blows that bomb up. Chaos ensues everywhere. And then the outcome's like, the outcome's pretty, pretty crazy, right? For the first episode. Yeah. Well, so like Hill sees Fury and then he waves at her. And I actually made a note of this of like, since when does Fury wave? And smile. Hill. Like, <laughs> come on. You know there's scrolls around. You just walk towards him, not acting like himself. Because, once again, they don't have the mental link with Fury. So, when he's pretending to be him, he can't really be him very well. So, like, instantly that was like, that's not Fury. He's smiling at you and waving in a weird way. Don't go towards him. But, I mean, he could have shot her, you know, from where she was. Anyway, anyway, like yeah. it's not like she walked that far, but just that whole interaction, I was just like, clearly that's not him. Like, Fury doesn't wave. <laughs> yeah, I like how you brought that up because that whole time where Gravik was embodying Fury, I thought that was such a funny part. Not because of the outcome, no, no, like he'll get shot. That's that's not funny at all. No. But the the facial expressions that Samuel Jackson made in those scenes were so off the wall. Like his yeah. eyes grew like three times in size. He had this like maniacal smile on. And again, I think that just leads to, or sorry, builds into Gravik, like, press the button, no hesitation. And then he's, like, psychopathically enjoying what he's doing to Hill because of how it's affecting Fury. Because there is a history there that I'm, I'm guessing we're going to be exploring in the next couple episodes between Gravik and Fury. Because they did make yeah. note that Fury knew him as a kid but doesn't know him now and that kind of thing. So, and that that's the end of the episode is Fury shot. Or sorry, not Fury. Fury shoots Hill. And then the real Fury kind of scares Gravik away before he can finish the job even though she does anyway. And then Fury sees the body runs away. So, a couple episodes. He doesn't, run, he doesn't run away. He bends over Hill, and then someone comes and pulls him away. So, um, we don't officially know what happened to Hill. Like, yes, we assume she's died, yeah. but as you and I talked about, I don't think it was enough time for us to 100% know she wasn't a scroll um, to have turned back, or that she's officially dead and someone didn't come grab her body and resurrect her because you know this is marvel yeah tahiti just send her to the to, tahiti we're gonna have a new agents of hill show coming yeah. out <laughs> yeah well here's the thing so if she died they turn into a scroll pretty quickly after that 
but I don't even think Fury checked her pulse or anything. No, so, he got pulled away too quickly. Yeah. So like, it's still up in the air of what has happened to actually to Hill. Because that would be kind of crazy, right? First episode, yes, she played a pretty integral part in the first episode, kind of setting the stage. It would be an emotional uh, steroid for Fury for the rest of the season, which would be cool. But I just find it weird that they would kill off um, Maria Hill that quickly into the show based on her history in the movies. Like, since the original Avengers, she's been, like, his right-hand man, which maybe they're replacing her with Talos? I don't know. Very interesting. Do you have any other questions that kind of were brought up because of this episode? Uh, I mean, we only got a glimpse of Rowdy. Um, yeah. But it just... I don't know. It didn't seem like he was on Fury and Hill's side. So it'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Yeah, we got to keep an eye out on basically every single key <laughs> character going into this show because anybody can be as we've established that yeah. they have taken over. So we keep an eye out for that. I have a lot of questions about Saber, what Fury was doing up there, because to me, it just it makes no sense. I understand what people and, and you yourself when you say, like, it's humanizing him. Like, the, the blip affected him greatly. He's always in control. So the fact that he lost control, it's got him shaken. He's trying to regain some of that control. And I I can see that. But to me, what I'm seeing is that Fury, he made a promise in Captain Marvel that he was going to find them a home planet. So what my head is immediately going to, like, he came back from the blip, and he said, I have unfinished work that I need to finish. So that's what he's doing on Saber, is trying to get them. To find a home through Saber, or maybe Saber is the home because it'll have defensive capabilities to protect them from the Kree, or whatever that case may be. But yeah, so what do you overall? How do you rate this first episode? Let's give it a, a rating out of ten. Like, how much did this episode lead you into the next episode with hype? Uh, it gave me hype. I wouldn't say I felt it was like an amazing episode. Like, there's a lot of questions. It was slow. Um, had a great ending. Like, I would give it an eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. I had I had a very so we talked and then I watched it a second time. I was like, okay, like let's see what it's built. It'd be very fun. Uh, so yeah, I, I, first time I saw it, I'd, I'd give it like a five, just because I <laughs> I compare it against the other shows, right? Like Wandavision. The first after the first episode of Wandavision, I was I ripped out clumps of my hair. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> see, I, I saw that first episode and I was like, I love this i yeah. am obsessed with this show yeah exactly <laughs> i was like give me the second episode of one division now same with loki yeah. i was very pumped on loki too mm -hmm. moon knight i don't really want to talk about that um <laughs> but yeah all right guys so that's that's our little review breakdown of the first episode of secret invasion i hope you enjoyed it make sure you like share and subscribe this stuff be coming out with another episode for episode two and then episode three four five and six and then uh we'll do a, a movie one for the Marvels, which I'm actually very excited about. You got a hype level for the Marvels movie? Oh, I'm very hyped. Yeah, I'm very excited to see um, what is her her superhero name? Photon? I think it's Photon. Yeah, I think Rambo. So. I think yeah, Rambo. I'm yeah. excited to see her character because what she did in the uh, WandaVision show, how she would kind of unlock that potential. I thought it was really. Yep. Anyway, guys, this was a long episode. We'll try and cut it in half next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.